The Human Experiment by Dr. David Carmichael. Chapter 12, Origins and Consequences of Food Production. Question, answer. What was the most important human invention of all time? The answer, the origin of food production is arguably the most important development of human prehistory. The beginnings of agriculture and human husbandry mark the most fundamental shift in human adaptation ever recorded. Moreover, it seems to be the only time a species has made a significant adaptive change without undergoing spe speciation. In other words, rather than our species evolving a new adaptive form in response to environmental changes, we altered the environment to accommodate our changing needs. Not surprisingly, a development of this magnitude has been the subject of a great deal of research in archaeology. Many scholars have contributed to our current understanding of where food production was developed, when it happened, and why it happened at all. More recently, in light of the challenges facing, currently facing our species, researchers have also examined the consequences of food production. This chapter provides a brief introduction to each of these various and complex topics. Students should gain a basic understanding of what food production is and what it consequent what it consequences are, both positive and negative. You should be also become aware of where aware of where and when different sorts of plants and animals were domesticated, and you will be able you will be introduced to the various explanations proposed for the beginnings. <clears throat> of food productions, as well as the evidence and arguments that have been used to evaluate the, those explanations. Domestication. Food production involves manipulation, manipulating nature to generate food supplies in greater quantities and or in different locations than would occur naturally in the wild. Although the process is accompanied by various technological developments at the most basic level, food production is based on the domestication of plants and animals. Domestication is the process of changing plants and animals in ways that bring them under human con humans control. Humans control the breeding and distribution of plants and animals, selecting for certain traits that we find useful. This process is commonly referred to by the Darwin term Darwin gave it, artificial selection. Plant and animal species are changed by the selective, I'm sorry, pressures imposed by humans to favor the traits desired by farmers and breeders. The traits humans find useful often vary widely from one species to the next. For cattle, we might select the greater hardiness or increased milk production. For sheep, greater docility and wool production are often the desired traits. Some varieties of plants have been bred for their larger fruit or for seeds that stay attached to the plant until they are harvested by humans, as in the case of corn. Other plants have been selected for their ability to thrive at high altitudes, in colder climates, in marginal soils. Each case of domestication and each variety developed from ancestor species can, constitutes a separate sequence of genetic experiments undertaken over a long period of time, spanning many generations. Thus, domestication is a process, not an event. Different species of plants and animals were domesticated, domesticated at different times and in different places. In most instances of domestication probably resulted from long-term interactions between humans and the individual species involved, included, including repeated attempts to change specific traits or expand the region in which a species could exist. Traditional classifications of prehistory identify food production as the hallmark of the Neolithic period. But we know that humans didn't reach the beginning of the Neolithic and suddenly decide it was time to begin farming. 
Instead, they had been experimenting with plant and animal manipulation for thousands of years. Archaeological evidence now shows the, the beginning of domestication go back at least 10,000 years in some parts of the world. The main reason to undertake domestication appears to have been to increase the food supply. The main, event, main benefit would be that more people could be supported by increasingly the productivity of the land through the use of new farming or husbandry technologies. As we will see, this didn't solve all of humanity's problem and it actually caused some new ones. But first, let's consider some of the traditional attitudes about agriculture and how new data required their reconsideration. In the early days of archaeology, it was widely believed that humanity was generally uninventive and that only certain cultures had attained the highest levels of sophistication. It was presumed that the few highly developed cultures were the donors of knowledge that was passed along somewhat imperfectly to the surrounding less developed recipient cultures. In historic times, people of Euro-American heritage identified their own ancestral cultures as being the more highly developed and as they became aware of prehistoric cultures in other parts of the world, they brought that attitude to the study of those cultures as well. So as Europeans learned about the ancient Greeks and Romans, they identified those cultures as the sources of prehistoric knowledge. After the discovery of even earlier Egyptian dynasties, Egypt came to be viewed as the center of prehistoric learning and sophistication. This belief became formalized as the heliocentric school of thought. Scholars believe that other prehistoric cultures were imperfect copies of dynastic Egyptian culture. If it was as if Egypt was the, at the center of the prehistoric world, influencing all other cultures, like the concentric ripples caused by a pebble thrown into a pond, Egyptian influence would be felt by all of the surrounding cultures. But in an increasingly attenuated and imperfect form as the distance from Egypt increased. With the acceptance of evolutionary thought in anthropology, the heliocentric view became discredited. Individual cultures are not viewed as more or less perfect copies of a single culture that happen to reach a high level of sophistication. Rather, all cultures can to be viewed as adaptations to the different local and regional environments within which they were situated. Much of the evidence for this idea that cultures adapt comes from the study of plant and animal domestication. Mm -hmm. Consider the following scenario proposed by Thor Hay Heyerdahl, I'm so sorry, in 1969. He proposed that Egyptians could have traveled to Central or South America by building reed boats and following the Canary current from east to west across the Central Atlantic Ocean in order to test the seaworthiness of the Egyptian crafts. He built such a boat and sailed across the Atlantic to Barbados. Does this mean that domestic Egyptian culture influenced prehistoric cultures in the Americas? No, it doesn't. In fact, when one examines the evidence for plant and animal domestication in two regions, it becomes clear there was no prehistoric contact. As discussed below, different crops were grown in Egypt and Mexico. These crops involved several different involved different farming techniques, harvesting methods, and processing and storage technologies. The food and their preparation methods are entirely different in, two, in the two areas. In short, the data on food production are some of the most important pieces of evidence in support of the conclusion that food production was independently invented in six or seven different parts of the world. Figure 
Let's consider some of the evidence. Here is the graph. I'll try and get as close because it is really tiny. <laughs> And these are figure 12.1 agricultural crops in the regions. Multiple centers of domestication. What would the food of India be without curry or curry powder without peppers? Indonesia sambals without their distinctive fire. Hungary's goulash without the paprika. Italy's antipasta, antipasta without pepperoni. 500 years ago, none of the people in these countries had ever seen or heard of a chili pepper. No world, old world language had a word for chili peppers before 1492. Andrews, 1992, page 81. Most Americans have only a vague sense of where our food comes from other than knowing that they purchase it for, at a supermarket. I'm not referring to the fact that the supermarket chains buy and ship from many parts of the globe. Rather, I mean the most people don't know where the crops were originally domesticated. We may have some ideas about the nature of various regional and ethnic cuisines based on our experiences in the foreign food aisle at the grocery store or our occasional visit to an ethnic restaurant. But even many of the, those ideas are incorrect. Consider potatoes, for instance. Okay, now looking at potatoes, which is right there, you can see where the origins of potatoes came from. If you can follow the little pictures. Three varieties of potatoes from among the hundreds of originally domesticated in Peru. When I ask my students where potatoes came, come from, I often receive the response, Idaho. That is incorrect. Many potatoes are grown in Idaho today, but that is not where the plant originated. My students' next guess is often Ireland, but this is also incorrect. Potatoes were actually domesticated in Peru perhaps as early as 8,000 to 10,000 years ago. Peruvian connection. Peruvian Indians have about 200 names for a variety of potatoes found in the Andes Mountains. The region with the greatest variety and oldest examples of domesticated plants are generally considered the likely areas of first domestication. But if you didn't know potatoes come from, came from Peru, you're not alone, even likely are areas of first domestication. But if you didn't know potatoes came from Peru, you're not alone. Even a series culinary books can sometimes be misleading but about the origins of domesticates. For example, in a well-known book about Scottish cooking, potatoes are identified as key ingredients in several traditional recipes, such as toddy soup and champit toddies. Similarly, Kokanen Champ and Boxty are examples of traditional Irish dishes made of potatoes. Yet, potatoes weren't introduced to Europe until the late 1500s and weren't widely used in England until the late 18th century. Italian food is another traditional ethnic cuisine. This is the, at least somewhat familiar to most Americans, or is it? In the World Cook's Collection Cookbooks, White Men E.T. Al claim, if there is one ingredient that sums up the essence of Italian cooking, it must surely be pasta. Italy pasta is essential part of every full meal. Yet authors, as the authors go on to admit, pasta, which is made from wheat, was originally developed in Asia and brought by Italy to Mar by Marco Polo. A quick look at the menu at most good Italian restaurants will reveal additional traditional dishes whose ingredients did not originate in Italy or the Mediterranean region. When looking at the menu for one of El Paso's best Italian restaurants, which 
shall remain na nameless, one finds numerous references to tomatoes, but tomatoes were domesticated in South America. Minestrone is a favorite traditional soup, usually containing zucchini, which was domesticated in Mexico. Linguini grilled chicken Milano in the style of Milan, uh, obviously contains chicken, but chickens was domesticated in Southeast Asia. Polenta is a traditional staple food from Northern Italy, Italy but it was made from boiled cornmeal and corn was domesticated in Mexico. To round out our Italian feast, let's finish up with the tiramisu. The traditional Italian dessert containing cocoa, which is also from Mexico, and coffee, which is thought to have originated from Ethiopia. To demonstrate that long distance borrowing has occurred in several di directions, let us briefly consider some traditional t dishes from the cookbook of the famous Chinese culinary artist Fu Pei Mei. Shrimp with cashew nuts, Kung Pao chicken, and sauteed prawns with tomato sauce. The shrimp and chicken are certainly indigenous to China, but cashew nuts and tomatoes originated from South America. The peanuts used in Kung Pao chicken were from South America and the chili peppers originated in South America and or Mexico. In fact, all of the hot peppers used in Southeast Asian cuisines are descended from stocks that originated in the New World. So where does this leave us? By examining the seeds, bones, and other food remains preserved in archaeological deposits, it is now possible to identify the areas where many or most of our foods were first domesticated. For plants, we look to the regions that have the wild ancestors, the most varieties, and the earliest examples. Domesticates are often recognizable by increased seed size or expanded range relative to the wild ancestors. For animals, archaeologists examine the bone re refuse for changes in the sex ratios and age distribution within animal populations. It has been possibly died to identify at least half a dozen regions in which domestication was invented independently at somewhat different times and involving different species, figure 2.1 or 12.1. Up with this. This is the uh, corn. The earliest evidence of domestication comes from Southwest Asia or the area of Mesopotamia, often referred to as the Fertile Crescent, largely within present day Turkey and Iraq. Beginning as early as 9,000 to 10,000 years ago, populations domesticated cereal grains such as rye, wheat, and barley. They also cultivated figs and raised animals such as sheep, goats, cattle, and dogs. Food production in Mexico also began about 9,000 to 10,000 years ago with the domestication of squash, including pumpkin, corn, acorn, Hubbard zucchini, and crookneck, maize, and various kinds of beans. In addition, Avocados, cocoa, and vanilla originated in Mexico. Domesticated animals were limited to dogs, turkey, and macaws, also dating as far back as 9,000 to 10,000 years. South American cultigens include tomatoes, machete, squash, potatoes, sweet potatoes, cotton, lima, be lima beans, peanuts, and chili peppers. Andean natives also domesticated llamas, alpacas, guinea pigs, and dogs. East and Southeastern Southeast Asia food production begins about 7,000 to 8,000 years ago. Plants from those regions include rice, several types of millet, bananas, taro, yam, and mung beans. Domesticated animals include chicken, pig, and dog, Farming developed still later in Africa about 4,000 years ago. The main crops were sorghum, pearl millet, and African rice. Finally, archeological evidence has documented an interesting case of independent inter invention 
of agriculture in Eastern North America about 3,000 to 4,000 years ago. A series of indigenous plants, some of which are today considered undesirable weed species, were domesticated by Native Americans in the Illinois and Ohio River drainages. The plants included marsh elder, sunflower, and chino alms, such as sumpweed, goosefoot, and pigweed. Their larger, sorry, their larger seed and wild, wider geographical distribution relative to the wild ancestral from ident uh, ancestral forms identified the domesticated forms by 2,000 years ago. These local crops were replaced by Mexican agricultural species, corn, beans, and squash, and technology. A comparison of domestication in the old world versus new world yields several patterns throughout most of the new world. Food production began later in the old world by perhaps 500 to 1,000 years later in Mexico, and even later in the other parts of the hemisphere. In addition the, the, to the use of different species, there are differences in emphasis between the old world, old and new worlds. In the old world, we see a greater use of domesticated animals, not only for food, but also as beasts of burden. A use was not widespread in the new world. In the new world, there is a greater emphasis on the use of domesticated plants. Moreover, there were more radical changes in plant form, such as the development of the cob in ear of maize. In the new world, we see more diversity in the kinds of plants used and a wider range of new technologies developed to process and consume them. Examples include the development of potatoes specifically intended for freeze-drying pottery vessels that served as popcorn poppers and maniotic, ma maniac graters consisting of plants with rows of razor-sharp obsidian blades embedded in the surface. It should be clear by now that the onset of agriculture was a very, very big deal that affected most of the globe. It spread into nearly all in the environments that would support it within about 6,000 years of its invention. Why might this be the case? What is, about, what is it about agriculture that led most populations on the planet to embrace it? If you can hunt it, if you can hunt and gather, why farm? For roughly 95% of our time as a species, humans lived as hunter-gatherers, deriving the bulk of our diet from wild plant and animal resources. Yet for many years, it was assumed that farming must be better. Hunter-gatherers were often portrayed as unsophisticated, warlike peoples barely able to eke out a meager existence and after all, the great civilizations of the world are all agrian based. So it must be best to, a best thing to do, right? Well, perhaps not. It seems that this is another example of hindsight bias. Contrary to popular belief, hunting and gathering is a healthy, more or less sustainable and relatively easy way of life. In 1966, the man, the hunter symposium, which convened at the University of Chicago, ushered in an era during which anthropologists have closely studied and reported many details of hunter-gather lifeways. And the end result and the results have revised traditional stereotypes the hunter-gather diet. In most regions of the world, with the tropics and temperate, temperate zones, hunter-gather diets are comprised primarily of gathered foods. Hunted game make up a relatively small proportion of the diet, perhaps 15%. 
while the rest consists of gathered plant foods and small animals such as insects, reptiles, and mice. Hunter-gatherers usually have to rely on a wide variety of food sources because wild plants and animals are often widely dispersed across the landscape and most resources are not highly concentrated. As a result, the most common, the most common hunter-gatherer diet is what we refer to as a broad spectrum. Hunter-gatherer groups in the Great Basin optimized, epitomized this pattern. Subst substance activities were dominated by plant gathering and individual bands identified between 29 and 81 different plant species that were used for food. The main exceptions up to this pattern occur in groups adapted to the Arctic where there are few plants and the boreal forest where diets are often focused on fish, sea mammals, or large herd animals. Excuse me. Hunter-gatherers exhibit an intimate and amazingly detailed knowledge of the environments to which they are adapted. Some of the food sources they used items that would be overlooked by our society made it possible to survive in environments that are not, were not suitable for other adaptations. For example, some, some brand, bands of Aborigines traveled long distances to the Australian Alps in order to hunt moths as they gathered in narrow canyons and crevices. Insects were se also seasonally important food in the Great Basin. During the autumn, grasshoppers are very abundant. When cold weather sets in these, insects are numbed and can easily be gathered by the bushel. At such times, they dig a hole in the, in the sand, heat stones in a fire nearby, and put some hot stones in the bottom of the hole. Put on a layer of grasshoppers, then a layer of hot stones, and continue to this until they put bushels on to roast. They left, in, they left it until cool when they are taken out, thoroughly dried and ground into meal. Grasshopper gruel or grasshopper cake is a great treat. Perhaps one of the most fascinating and efficient uses of plant resources by hunter-gather is the second harvest of the Pitilia practiced by the Cochimi Indians of Baja, California and recorded by Jesuit missionaries. Pitihi is a cactus with a large edible fruit containing many small black seeds distributed throughout the flesh. During the short season when the fresh fruits are available, the Cochimi would eat great quantities, seeds and all, a behavior the missionaries decried as glutinous. The Cochimi established an area on a large flat boulder where everyone would defecate. Then later in the year, during the dry season when fewer foods were available, they would return to the rock we know the petihi seeds out of the dried feces and grind them into flour or meal, which could be made into a gruel. The second harvest reflects a truly remarkable understanding of the ecological details and food potential of the environment. Hunter-gatherer society. Hunter-gatherer populations are generally small with local bands of consisting of 25 to 50 individuals. Larger, larger seasonal concentrations of several bands sometimes numbered up to 250 people or so, but they are short-lived because most food sources are not concentrated enough to support such large groups. This is commonly a division of labor within bands based on gender and age, with men doing most of the hunting and women and children doing most of the gathering. It is often necessary for members of the same band to be in more than one, pl one place at the same time because the ripening of different plant foods and the opportunities for, I'm sorry, 
her encountering game often occur in different locations. When required by these scheduling challenges, the band is split into smaller task groups that are focused on a particular set of resources and the foods obtained by each task group is returned to a base camp to be shared with other members of the band. Sharing is absolutely essential in hunter gather adaptation because it, when anyone is successful in acquiring resources, the entire group benefits. Sharing is required within at least the, the extended family and many groups. Many groups. The successful hunter is required to share the game so completely that he and his family might bend, band. In some cases, sharing of this sort is formalized with each portion or cut of the carcass being designated for a specific relative. I documented this firsthand among the Mescalero Apaches when I attended the funeral for Bernard, Bernard II, my adopted Apache brother. Two deer were shot to contribute to the dinner prepared for Bernard's close relatives and the carcass were hung on poles lashed between trees behind the house. Our nephew, Medicine Bird, was visiting from Oklahoma where he was attending a college at the time. And when he was preparing to leave for the drive back, my Apache sister handed me a butcher knife and asked me to go out and cut off Medicine Bird's portion. She didn't ask me merely to cut a piece of meat for him. She asked me to cut his piece, the piece that was des designated as is as his by virtue of his being Bernard's nephew. As Bernard's brother, I received a different portion. The entire carcass was butchered that way, with the pieces apportioned according to the recipient's relationship to the deceased. In Aboriginal times, such arrangements meant that the successful hunter's family might not get any meat, but when others were successful, he would receive his designated portion of their kills. The overall effect of this of, is that the band as a whole is fed no matter who makes a kill, and one no one accumulates very much more than anyone else. This is considered a good thing in hunter-gather societies. Hunter-gather residential mobility. For our purposes in examining the beginnings of agriculture, perhaps the most salient characteristics of hunter-gather adaptations is their high degree of mobility. Because many wild plant and animal resources are widely dispersed of low density and incongruent different resources are not all in the same places, hunter-gather adaptations generally require very large territories. The Kahalahari Bushmen, for example, might travel as far as 1,500 kilometers per year, relocating their camps every few weeks in order to take advantage of the key resources available in different portions of their territory. Yet territorially is generally lo loosely organized. Band membership is fluid with families coming and going and territories are usually not physically defended. When times are tough in one region, band mem members may temporarily move to other areas where they have relatives and that relationship provides access to neighboring territories. Hunter-gatherers have few material possessions because they are constantly on the move. So the maintenance of social networks upon which one can rely during times of hardship rather than the accumulation of material goods is the measure of success. So how are hunter-gatherers relevant to understanding the beginnings of agriculture? We know that many times that that many, perhaps most domesticates, were developed by hunter-gatherer populations. But we also know that even the hunting peoples knew about domesticates and agricultural techniques. They did not commit to them right away. In the southwestern U.S., about 2,000 years 
passed between the introduction of corn and the shift to farming based on corn agriculture. We also know that the hunter-gatherers added more and more species of plants to their diets over time, apparently in response to increases in local and regional population densities. In the Tehucan Valley of Mexico, some domesticates such as chili and avocado appear in the agricultural record by 8,000 or 9,000 years ago, but they represent only a few of the 20 or so plants identified at the time. A variety of agricultural plants were added to the diet over time, but most were added fairly late after 1000 BC. In other words, most of the agricultural plants were among the later additions to the hunter-gatherer diet. This lag time in the switch to an emphasis on domesticates suggests that agriculture, <clears throat> I'm sorry, was not the first choice of responses to resources. Stress, even among people who already knew how to farm, indeed, it seems they sought, first sought other ways to intensify or increase their gathered food sources by adding more species to the diet. Shifting to smaller games such as rodents and intensifying wild species such as agave, the shift to reliance on agriculture seems to have been their choice of a last resort. The idea that populations shifted to agriculture only when they had no other options makes sense. When we look at the consequences of domestication, agricultural technology changes the carrying capacity of the land, supporting a larger number of people than hunting and gathering would in the same area. Therefore, agriculture makes sense as a response to population growth. Agriculture also provides a way to deal with natural fluctuations in climate and the availability of wild foods. If surplus agricultural products are stored, they can be relied upon during times of hardship. See figure 12.10 and 12.11. A commitment to farming usually means that populations reduce their mobility, staying closer to the agricultural lands that must be tended. Thus, agriculture leads to increased sedentism. The development of more settled communities, additionally surplus agriculture, agricultural products can be used as capital for trade to invest in public works or to support individuals who don't have to work in food production, such as artisan and soldiers. Here's the 12, 10 and 12, 11. Unintended consequences of food protection. Unfortunately, when populations shift to a reliance on agriculture, the disadvantages outnumber the advantages. Agriculture is more labor intensive than hunting and gathering. Hunter gatherers can often feed their families with about two or three days worth of work per week. Such is not the case for farmers and pastoralists. Any of you who were raised on farms or ranches will know that you had little or no leisure time, especially during planting, cultivation, and harvest. Farming is so labor intensive that the labor needs of farmers heavily influence the way we structure the academic year in the United States. We have a summer vacation, mainly because in generations past, the children of farm families were needed as laborers during the growing season. As the use of new agricultural technologies increased, such as clearing forest for farmland, construction, constructing irrigation ditches, excavating or drilling water wells, so did the demand for labor. The switch to agricultural production also leads to several kinds of environmental degradation. There is often a loss of wild animal species because of overhunting in the vicinity of a sedentary community. Clearing the land by cutting the forest 
or burning off brush further reduces the biodiversity of the region by removing or altering plant or and animal habitat. And when populations rely on single or few crops instead of many wild species that used to be available, they become more susceptible to crop failure due to severe weather, plant disease, <coughs> excuse me, and insect depredations. The removal of the mature natural vegetation also exposes the soils to increased erosion. It may surprise you to learn that the diet of the subsistence, subsistence farmers is actually often nutritionally inferior to that of the hunter gatherers. Agricultural diets are higher in carbohydrates and lower in proteins and minerals such as iron. As a result, farming populations have higher incidences of iron deficiency, tooth enamel defects, dental cavities, and degenerative joint disease than hunting populations. Children in agricultural groups mature much mature more slowly, are more likely to experience malnutrition, and are more likely to have intestinal parasites, and as adults, their bodies are smaller and shorter than hunters. Due to population increases, crowding and sh sharing their living space with livestock agricultural groups are more likely to live in conditions of pollution and have higher incidences of infectious diseases. And as is, if this is weren't bad enough, it was competition to control productive farmland that led to the development of human warfare. So the shift to an agricultural lifestyle has had many, mainly negative consequences for humanity. If farming is so bad, then why would anyone do it? The short answer is because our ancestors had no other choice. Researchers have proposed a variety of explanations for the beginnings of agriculture, extending back to V. Gordon Child's OASIS model. Several early explanations were based on the premise that the adoption of the agriculture was better, has obvious advantages, or was predestined. But we now know this is not the case. Today, most researchers would argue that some version of a population pressure model, e.g. the views of Bineford, Flannery, Bosserup, and Rindos, is a better explanation. There appears to have been slow but the end of the Ice Age. The populations were not large by modern standards, but they were large enough to generate crowding and competition in the context of hunter-gather adaptations. For example, what happened when one hunting band moved its village to the next valley and for the first time found another band already living there. Archaeological sites have yielded evidence of skeletal stress, suggested decreased quality of food supplies. Diets were broadened by the addition of insects, mice, and less desirable plants, the ones harder to produce and process. Only after these steps were taken did prehistoric populations turn to a reliance on agricultural crops. People didn't choose the path of domestication until they had to, and it was probably not a conscious choice, at least initially. But it seems to have occurred at first in the marginal areas where food stress was most acute, and it quickly spread to other regions as populations continued to grow. The agricultural trap Human populations have continued to grow and grow and grow. Once populations have committed to agriculture as a response to population growth, it sets up a positive feedback loop. It is possible to increase productivity to produce more food by using the new technology associated with a shift to agriculture. Producing more food, perhaps even generating a surplus will permit further population growth, which will require increased agricultural production, which in turn leads to more population growth. You see where this is going? Some researchers refer to this as a vicious cycle as the agricultural trap. And I would argue that we are still caught in it. 
a process of increasing agricultural productivity through the investment of increased technology and labor resources is referred to as intensification. Let's consider a hypothetical but realistic sequence of changes in agricultural production that might occur in a given region over a long period of time. One, a population <clears throat> that has been farming the river bottoms finds that population growth has outstripped the food supply. Two, they open up the the new fields in the upland areas away from the river using a swidden, a slash and burn techniques in which the trees are chopped down and burned. After one or a few seasons, the cleared fields are allowed to lie fallow so that the soil nutrients can be replaced. But as population continues to grow, there is pressure to shorten the fallow period. Three, the society fish shifts to a brush fallow approach, which mean, means swidden fields are not allowed to sit idle long enough for trees to regrow. Instead, they are cleared again as soon as shrubs have grown up and clearing such fields is more labor intensive than simply cutting and burning trees. For cultivation is a logical next step in which fields are cleared of weeds and other plants to, that compete with the cultigens for water. Entire families are out in the fields using hoes to chop weeds and someone needed to invent the hoes. Five, people living in the same, in some environments learn to do crop rotation and they can now produce two or three crops per year as long as they plant in the correct sequence that allows one crop to replenish the soil with the nutrients needed by the following crop. Six, fertilization is another way to increase productivity. Farmers carry the feces of domesticated animals to the agricultural fields and mix them into the soil. They learn to bury fish in the holes they dig for planting seeds but obtaining the fish is a lot of work and using a fish as a fertilizer means people aren't consuming them directly. Seven, in dry years, some fields fail so the people learn to design, construct, and maintain irrigation dishes to bring water to the fields. Special community groups and leadership roles have to be created and organized to oversee the labor needed to build and operate the irrigation system. Eight, the society learns that neighboring population is also looking to expand its agricultural production, but all the goods, all the good farmlands are already being used. So the leaders organize the population and make war on the neighbors in order to control of their farmlands. Nine, Following the Industrial Revolution, it becomes possible to greatly expand the areas farmed by using machines to do most of the farm labor, such as plowing, cultivating, harvesting, hauling the, pr the produce to market, and drilling deep wells. With each level of intensification, there are increased costs and the ability to accommodate additional population growth sets up another cycle of growth and stress requiring still more intensification. The costs associated with the last level of intensification are precisely those with which we are still trying to cope. There are the costs of making steel for the machines and rubber for their tires. The gasoline or diesel fuel that powers the equipment and the oils and grease lubricants they require, they are the chemical fertilizers sprayed from behind a tractor for or a low-flying airplane. They are the highways and railroads needed to deliver the food products to the distributors and markets, as well as the trucks, trains, and ships needed to transport them. They are the freezers, <clears throat> refrigerators, and other storage facilities, as well as the coolants and electrical power needed to operate them. Today's agriculture is enormously expensive and it generates a larger environmental impact than most people seem to realize. 
Let's examine a few statistics regarding the cost of technology in general and consider the proportional changes apply to the agricultural, propor agricultural portion. Prehistoric global energy use prior to the, <clears throat> the beginnings of food production has been estimated at 0.002 terawatts TW for a population of 5 to 10 million people. TW equals 1 TW equals 1 tr trillion watts. World consumption in 1990 was 13 TW or 7,000 to 13,000 times higher. The whole system 2007. The overall rate of technology change continues to increase rapidly. Witness how quickly our computers become obsolete. The cost of such rapid technological change is illustrated by the oil demands of U.S. military. It is estimated that the average soldier in Iraq used about seven, to seven times more oil per day than was the case in the first Gulf War. Because our agriculture production is mechanized and because our distribution system is dependent on oil, it now takes about 10 fossil fuel calories to produce one food calorie for the American diet. About 15% of the U.S. energy is consumed in supplying the country with food, with about half used re in production and half going to food processing and packaging. Food items in the U.S. grocery store have traveled an average of 1,500 miles to get there, and one study in the United Kingdom indicated that distances involved in global transportation have risen by 50% over the past 20 years. The international food system is amazingly complicated and inefficient, at least in terms of transportation cost. Researchers at the Swedish Institute for Food Biotechnology studied the steps involving, involved in growing the tomatoes, converting them to paste, making tomato ketchup, and packaging them, packaging and storing the ketchup for distribution. It is distressing to learn that manufacture of something of as mundane as a bottle of ketchup includes more than 52 processing and transportation steps, many involving international shipments. The tomatoes were grown in Italy and converted into tomato paste. Bags used to package the tomato paste were made in the Netherlands, shipped to Italy to be filled, and then shipped to Sweden where the ketchup was produced. The plastic bottles were made in the United Kingdom or Sweden out of materials from Japan, Italy, Belgium, the United States, and Denmark. The screw, crap, the screw cap was made in Denmark and shipped to Sweden. Still other processes include transportation of fertilizers, pesticides, and the operation of farm equipment and processing machinery. Now think about the effects of a more or less similar level of complexity being embedded in the production of many other foods we consume. Even when processing costs are minimum, minimal, transportation can still be costly. Because they travel by air instead of ship, Hawaiian pineapples are among the most carbon intensive food of foods contributing to about 40 pounds of CO2 carbon dioxide per pound of pineapple. That is about 10 times the hot next highest figure among foods studied. David Pimentel, Pimentel, professor of agricultural science at Cornell University, has estimated that if the rest of the world ate the way Americans do, all known fossil reserves would be exhausted in just seven years. The cost and inefficiency of the world food system, or at least that of developed countries, does not seem to be sustain sustainable, but we have yet to figure out, figure a way out of the agricultural trap. This is the end of chapter 12.